Well, good morning to you all. I'm going to ask you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Psalms. We're going to be reading this morning and studying this morning in the eighth Psalm. While you're turning there, I just want to say thank you so much for being here. It's a blessing and a privilege to worship with you and to be part of this church family with you. It is uh, easy to take for granted a church family. But when you stop and reflect and think about what life is like in this world, how amazing it is that we have so many people who have, as the Bible says, a like precious faith as ours. How amazing it is that we can come here this morning and worship with people, study with people, commune with people, who believe what we believe about Jesus and are doing everything in their power to serve Him with their lives. Thank you for being here. And thank you for your commitment to the Lord. It is a blessing to me. I want to begin by asking you this morning how much you think you matter. How much does your life matter? How valuable are you? In 2005, the London Zoo did something that uh, captured national and international headlines. They decided that in their zoo, they were going to put a creature on display that they had never displayed before in the history of the zoo. And so in addition to their collection of monkeys and lions and bears and everything else, they built a new enclosure to showcase, can you guess what it is? People. That's what they did. They built an enclosure and they put people in it. Now, I thought I should put up a slide of what that looked like because you would love to see that, but they were immodestly dressed, so I did not put that on the slide this morning. But that's what they did. They put 16 people, eight men, eight women, on display right next to all their other primates. And of course, mostly they did that for clicks, but they also wanted to drive, up, drive home a point. They did that because they wanted to remind their visitors that man is just another primate. Just like all the monkeys, just like all the orangutans, just like all the silverbacks that were there in that zoo, man is just another primate, just like those. In other words, we're not really anything special at all. I wonder if you ask the people who came up with that concept, the idea of displaying human beings in a zoo, I wonder how they would answer that question. How, how much do we matter? How valuable are we? How much is your life worth? In their eyes, probably not very much, right? You're just another creature on this earth. Just another primate. What is man? What am I? What is my life? What am I worth? That's a question that I believe strikes King David as he writes this psalm, Psalm 8. And here we find King David staring up into the sky at night, considering the vast expanse of heaven, and that is the thought on his mind. Who am I? What am I worth? Am I really valuable? And this is what he says, Psalm 8, beginning in verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth! who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. From the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him? And so there's David sitting on the side of a hill in the middle of the night, looking up into heaven, asking himself that same question, what is man? How valuable are we really? And here's the amazing answer that David provides. That at the end of the day, you are nothing. At the end of the day, we are nothing. We are small and insignificant and worthless. 
And I know that's a hard thing to see, but if, if you really think about yourself, if you really think about your life, if you really think about this world, if you really think about where you stand, then, then, then what David is teaching us is true, that really in the grand scheme of things, what are you? Nothing, really. Think about that for a minute. If you think about in, in, in this community, what are you? You think about this tiny little bedroom community of Tampa. I guess it's kind of getting bigger now. I don't know. It used to be a bedroom community, right? But in this tiny little city of Temple Terrace, Florida, what are you? Who are you? Yeah, your family may know who you are. You have friends at school, I'm sure. You have people who know your name. You have neighbors who know who you are. But at the end of the day, who are you in this community? Nobody's going to bump into you in the grocery store, shake your hand or see you, and then go out of the store and call their friend and say, hey, you'll never believe who I just saw buying milk, Guthrie Nelson. No way! Guthrie? Nobody knows who Guthrie is. Sorry, Guthrie. (laughs) But that's not just true of him. That's all of us, isn't it? You're not a political figure. You're not a celebrity. People bump into you in the grocery store, and they don't care. And so in this community, you are nothing. And then beyond that, in this country, you are nothing. You aren't on the news networks. You are not in Congress. You're not running the White House. You're not a famous athlete. And, 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 and despite what you may hear on social media or on the news during this period of time in our country with an election coming up, at the end of the day, your vote, your voice, really doesn't matter all that much. Now, before you get on me and say, hey, voting is an important civil thing, sure it is, but your voice is not as powerful as people say it is. Do you know how powerful your voice is in this country? One three hundred and thirty millionth, okay? That's how powerful your voice is. That's how much your voice matters here. How much is that? And so in this community, we are nothing. In this country, we are nothing. We're just another face in the crowd, right? And maybe you're sitting there and you're saying, okay, well, maybe, maybe that's true when it comes to going out to the grocery store. Maybe that's true when it comes to politics. Nobody knows my name. But what about, what about social media? Maybe, maybe on social media, maybe on the internet, I'm somebody, right? You don't know how many followers I have. You don't know how many friends I have on Facebook. Maybe you're sitting there today and you're like, I've got 6,000 friends on Facebook. I've got 20,000 followers on Instagram. Maybe you're even one of those people where companies contact you and they try to get you to rep their product and you actually make money on social media and you think, don't tell me nobody knows my name. People know who I am. Maybe that's true to a degree. But really in the grand scheme of things, let's say you have 6,000 friends on Facebook. Let's say you have 20,000 followers on Instagram. What is that? It would be interesting. I've If I could, I would stop and take a poll because I want to know who in this room has the most followers on social media. Somehow I'm going to figure that out. But no matter who it is, it's nothing compared to the rest of the world. Do you know who has the most followers on on social media? According to a quick Google search, I found that the most followers on social media is owned by this man, Cristiano Ronaldo, with 901 followers million followers on Instagram. And you may say, well, that's a lot, but maybe I'm second. Not really. You know who's second? Selena Gomez with 690 million followers. Do you know who's third? It's her old bae, Justin Bieber, with 595 million followers. So what are you? The truth is that your presence online is nothing. If Instagram canceled your account, nobody would notice. If Facebook shadow banned you, no one would care. And you might say, well, look, look that, that's not true of everybody, right? It's a, maybe it's true of me right now, but that's not true of everybody. Maybe, maybe I'm not that important, but one day I'm going to become important. One day I'm going to be somebody. One day I'm going to do something, and I'm going to be as famous as Ronaldo or Selena Gomez or Justin Bieber. One day I'm going to get there, and I want you to know that even if you do, you're still nothing. Do you know what Paul says? I'm Not Paul, Solomon says in the book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 2 verse 15, he, he talks about life. He says this, 
Then I said to myself, as is the fate of the fool, it will also befall me. Why then have I been extremely wise? So I said to myself, this too is vanity. For there is no lasting remembrance of the wise man as with the fool, inasmuch as in the coming days all will be forgotten, and how the wise man and the fool alike die. So I hated life, for the work which had been done under the sun was grievous to me, because everything is futility in striving after the wind. So let's say you become famous. Let's say you get a billion followers on social media. At the end of the day, what are you? You're nothing. You're going to die. The world is going to move on. You're going to be forgotten. And nobody will remember your name. And maybe you want to push back and say, well, what really matters to me is not being known. I don't care if people know my name or if I have this reputation or if I become famous. Maybe, maybe, maybe I can do something. Maybe even if nobody knows my name, I can do something that matters here in this world. And because I do something that matters, maybe if I make a difference in that way, if I do something important, then my life will matter. Then I will be worth something. Then my life will be valuable. But I want you to understand that even if you do something that changes this world, at the end of the day, you've still basically done nothing. Earlier in the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon says this, Ecclesiastes 1 verse 3, he says, What advantage does man have in all his work which he does under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. Also the sun rises and the sun sets, and hastening to its place it rises there again, blowing toward the south and turning toward the north. The wind continues swirling along, along, and on its circular courses the wind returns. All the rivers flow into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place where the rivers flow, there they flow again. And this is Solomon's way of saying, look, we live here on this earth, but nothing we do really changes the way this world works. This is what we've been talking about in the college class with the college kids on the book of, the, book of Ecclesiastes, that no matter what you do, you really can't change the way, the, world, the, the, the way this world works. And so what are you? What is your life? If you can't do anything that changes anything, what are you worth? At the end of the day, what are we? You know, maybe you think to yourself, you think, well, well look, I'm going to do something important. Let's say that you do something that really matters. Let's say you do something incredible. Let's, do, let's say you do something amazing. You do the thing that everybody in this world wants to do. Let's say that somehow, some way, you find a way to cure cancer. Let's say that you set up a, a lab in your backyard, and you're doing all the TEPS tubes and beakers and stuff like that, and somehow, some way, you figure out a 100% way to cure cancer, and you send it to all the hospitals. You do it all pro bono. You're not going to make any money off this, but you're going to send that cure out. You're going to cure everybody of cancer. What have you done? Nothing. Because the only thing you've done is guarantee that every single person on this earth will die of something other than cancer. And so what is man? If nothing we do really changes this world, then, then what are we worth? And even and when you consider the universe, when you look beyond our world our tiny little world that we inhabit, that becomes even more abundantly clear. In Psalm 8, David is he's looking up into the night sky. And he sees that expanse. And with far less information than you and I have at our disposal, he is overwhelmed and he says, what is man? And again, that is David's way of saying that, look, at the end of the day, I am nothing. I am small. When David looks into the night sky, he is completely dwarfed and overwhelmed by what he sees. And he should be. You know, we know far more about our universe than, than David did. We know from science that the observable universe is 92 billion light years wide. And there are some people in some studies that have been done that estimate that that 92 billion light years of observable universe that we are aware of, that we can see, is only 4% of what's really out there. One, one astronomer, I guess that's the right word for it, one, one astronomer uh, reasoned, he figured out that at the end of the day when you do all the math, 
there are more stars in our universe than there are grains of sand on earth. And so here we sit in this crowd, lost in some city, lost within some country, floating around on some tiny planet, completely dwarfed by the immensity of the universe. And David looks at all of that and he says, what is man? We are insignificant. We are small. We are nothing. But of course, that's not the message of the whole psalm. Because because the amazing thing about what David is saying here, the incomprehensible thing about what he's saying here is, look, at the end of the day, oops, sorry, at the end of the day, you are nothing, but you're still everything. You are nothing, but when God looks at you, you are everything to Him. So he goes on to say this, Psalm 8, beginning in verse 5, when talking about man, this small, insignificant being, he says, yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty. You make him rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name and all the earth. And so David says, here's the amazing thought, that really when you look at the world, you look at the universe, you look at all of this stuff, we are nothing, and yet God says we are everything. And that really doesn't make sense. And it's really not supposed to. I'm going to tell you that I don't quite understand, I don't think anyone can quite understand why God cares so much about people like us. I can't give you a good reason for why God would look at us as small and insignificant as we are and say that we are His everything. The only thing that I can say with certainty is that even though we are nothing, we are His everything. It is amazing when you look at all creation and you look at everything in this world, you look at all the billions and billions and trillions and quadrillions and all the aliens that I don't know how to pronounce beyond that, when you look at all of that stuff in the universe, the only thing that God really cares about is us. David says in verse 3, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Isn't that an astounding thought? Then all in all of these billions of light years of stuff, the only thing that God really cares about is you. And I wonder if Part of me wonders if the reason why God created so much is so that he could make that point. That in all this massive expanse, he doesn't really care about any of the rest of it. He just cares about us. In verses 5 through 6, David says that not only does he care about us and look on us in the middle of this vast expanse. David says that God has glorified us. He has made us a little lower than God. He made us like Him. He, we were made in His image as we learn in the book of Genesis. He has given us authority to rule over and, and take over His earth. He gave us a position unlike any other created thing, a position where we are stewards of His creation, a, a position where we are called not just to follow our base instincts, but we are called to live a, a high kind of life, a life of sacrifice, a life of selflessness, a life of, of, of morality and purity, a life of righteousness like Him. And I think it's important that we understand this too, that it is not enough to just say that God cares about us. We have to conclude that God also cares about You, God, cares about each and every one of us individually. You know, the truth is that that even when we sit here as Christians and we understand what the Bible says, even when we understand that, that God cares for mankind and He has done so much, even sending His own Son to die on a cross for the remission of our sins, even, even when we realize that, sometimes we still feel like we're lost in the crowd. 
Sometimes we think, well, look, maybe God cares for the really important people. Maybe God cares for Cristiano Ronaldo and Selena Gomez and Don Truex and Guthrie Nelson. But does God really care about me? Does God really see me? I'm not as important as those other people are. And the answer is that he does. In the book of Luke, Jesus says that not even a, not even a sparrow falls to the ground without God noticing it, caring about it. God cares about each and every one of us. And that's what we learn if you look at, you look at that. Uh, oh, I'm, I skipped ahead. I'm sorry. If you look in Luke, Luke chapter 15, I apologize. Luke chapter 15, this is where Jesus tells the parable of the lost sheep. And, and it drives home this point that, that God doesn't just care about the majority of mankind. He doesn't just care about mankind in general, that God cares about each and every one of us individually. In Luke 15, beginning in verse 4, Jesus says, What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. The amazing thing about our God is that He doesn't just care about humanity in general, that He cares about each and every one of us. And I understand the math is a little skewed here. The math isn't perfect here. But I believe what that passage teaches us is, look, at the end of the day, if you were were the only person who ever sinned, If Adam and Eve were perfect in the garden, and their sons and their daughters were all perfect, and every single person lived a perfect life up to to you, and you were the only one, you were the one who failed, you were the one who fell, you were the one who sinned, you were the one who walked away from God, he still would have sent Jesus to die on that cross to make sure that you had the chance to be saved. He cares not just about all of us, but about us individually. What is man? That's the amazing thing. As small and as insignificant as we are, as insignificant as I am, I am everything to God. Saving me and spending eternity with me, saving you, spending eternity with you, was worth God sending his son from heaven to earth to die at the hands of godless men, to be nailed to a cross so that he could redeem us and bring us home. And so that is the amazing truth of Psalm 8, that you are nothing, and yet you are everything. I hope that totally baffles you. I hope that's just an amazing thought to consider this morning. And while it is amazing and it is incomprehensible and it is impossible to wrap our minds around that, I want you to understand that there is is something that we are supposed to get out of that. We need to remember that the only reason my life matters is because my life matters to God. The only reason my life is worth something is because my life is worth something to God. The only reason I am valuable is because I am valuable to God. For no other reason does your life count. It only counts because God finds it valuable. And I think that's a really important thing for us to remember. Because in this world we are so tempted to root our value, to find our value in in, in so many other things. That's one of the fundamental questions that we always ask ourselves, right? Again, what am I worth? Why does my life matter? What, why, why am I worth something? Why am I valuable? That's a question we ask ourselves. And the problem is that we tend to answer that question in really bad ways, right? You look around the world, you look at the people you go to school with, you look at the people that you bump into in the grocery store that 
you don't know and don't know you. You look at all those people, and these are the kind of people, we live in a world where we measure our value in the wrong way. People measure their value, and they say, look, what really makes me valuable is the fact that I make a lot of money. What really makes me valuable is that I'm, I'm really good at my job. What makes me valuable is the fact that, 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 that I'm really healthy, and I'm really strong, and I'm really into fitness. fitness. I can lift a lot. I can run really fast. I'm really valuable because I'm really pretty. I'm really valuable because I'm really smart. I'm really valuable because I have all these abilities that I can do. And that's what makes me valuable. No, none of that does. And the reason why it's so bad to root your value in all of those things is for two reasons. First of all, all of those things, all of those things ultimately disappoint. You sit here and say, well, look, I'm valuable because I'm really athletic, right? And everybody's impressed with how fast I can run and how high I can jump and how strong I am in the gym. What's going to happen with that eventually? You're going to get old and slow. You're going to lose your hops, and you're not going to be able to do the things that you used to be able to do. And when you root your value in that, you're going to get to the end of your life and think what? I really am worthless. And some people look at themselves and say, look, the thing that makes me valuable is that, is that I'm, I'm really, really pretty. And everybody looks at me, and everyone thinks I'm beautiful, and everybody wants to date me. What happens with that? You get old. Your body decays. You get ugly. And you look at that thing that you rooted your value in, and what's it worth? Nothing. Nothing. The truth is that what we do is we root our value in these things that don't matter, and every single one of them ultimately lets us down because those aren't the things that really make us valuable. And it's also important, secondly, maybe more importantly to remember that because when we root our value in those things, it ultimately leads us into sin. If I believe that my abilities or my intellect or the fact that I make a lot of money, if I believe that's what really makes me valuable, then that's the God I'm going to serve. Because that's the God that makes me feel good. That's the God that makes me feel like I'm worth something. But that's the God that ultimately will destroy you. Brothers and sisters, it's important that we remember that we are nothing. The only reason that your life matters is because your life matters to God. He is the God that will not disappoint you. He is God, the God that truly cares about you. He is the reason why your life matters. What is man? We are nothing. And yet to God we are everything. And it's important that because we know that, we make sure that we make God our everything. It is so funny to see the contrast between these two things, that God looks at the vast expanse of the universe, the, the 92 billion light years of stuff and beyond. He looks at all of that stuff out there, and he says, the only thing I really care about is you. And yet here we sit in this world, and we look at all the stuff around us. And we look at all the little pretty things in this world. We look at all the interesting things in this world. And what do we do? We look at all this stuff and we say, what I really care about is not the God of heaven who loves me and gave his son to die for me. What I really care about is sports. What I really care about is my job. What I really care about is how much money I have in the bank. What I really care about is going out and having a good time. What I really care about is how many people liked my posts on social media. God looks at us in the midst of this vast universe and cares about us, and we look at this world and we completely ignore Him to focus on these meaningless things. You are everything to Him. And may it be that we look up into heaven this morning and realize that it is time to stop making our life about things that do not matter and to start making our lives about the God who is the only reason we matter. The Lord cares about you. You are His everything. 
Is he your everything? The Bible says that it is, it is our duty to look up into heaven and make God the center of our lives. And that starts, that starts by becoming a Christian. The Bible says that if we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, if we are willing to confess, uh, repent of our sins that caused Him to go to the cross, if we're willing to confess our belief before Him, then we can be baptized in water to have our sins washed away. We can rise to walk in newness of life, putting aside all the other gods and all the other things in this world that we try to put at the center, and truly for the rest of our lives seeking to serve God. He is the reason we matter, and He is the only thing that really matters in this world. If you'd like to serve Him this morning, we'd like to help you. If you'll come to the front while we stand and while we sing.